Hello, welcome everybody to With Thunder Applause, a podcast where two friends get together to discuss the events and ideas that will shape our uncertain future. I'm your host, Steve, along with my co-host, Zach, and we have an amazing show where we dive really deep into both the <laughs> events part and the ideas part today. How are you doing, Zach? Doing good. I've got mushrooms growing in a closet along with mead. There's sourdough everywhere. I'm trying to figure out how to propagate yeast and everything so that I don't have to keep buying it forever and I can just raise it and then use it to do my bidding. <laughs> now that is fucking I'm not sure of it as a is a um a business model in like the current kind of industrial no. economy, but um as shit hits the fan and as it becomes harder to source things from long distances yeah um that's going to be an incredibly important um skill to have yeah uh, to be able to maintain cultures for fermentation for the preservation of food or the production of things like ethanol right because we're going to need fuels and like ethanol is a is a potential it's not like a replacement for oil, but it would be a very, very useful fucking thing to have, right? To run some technologies on ethanol fuels. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's um, gonna want to, you know, do something electronic. Everyone wants to while. consume. Yeah, that's the main thing I'm focused on. If you can't get blotto during the apocalypse, then when can you? Yeah, I mean, I think back. You know, we're kind of talking about big apocalypses today. Um, I think the show is titled um it's only treason if you lose <laughs> holy war in its biggest stands um so it might feel like the end times and we're going to discuss that today but most certainly i think we can look to uh, examples that we know from our own history of like going to new orleans and hearing stories from like locals and shit of being yeah. like i don't know we didn't think like we needed to leave the city because like we have lots of fucking hurricanes and all we do is like <laughs> sandbag around the local pub and then get <laughs> fucking there. lit and have candles yeah. and lamps and other things to and musical instruments and stuff to keep us entertained we just drink together yep <laughs> um so i think that even uh in apocalypse is big and small it's always good to have good company and good drink very true Told me that. that's our branding <laughs> there you go friends food and family during the apocalypse yep Food no apocalypse bit too big or too small <laughs> cool cool okay so we're talking today again holy war in its biggest stands and this is something i've seen folks online touch on but i haven't seen them make certain connections right okay so i mentioned last time uh we got a new speaker mike johnson all of a sudden you know there's this prolonged speaker fight uh, to replace Kevin McCarthy. And all of a sudden there was this guy out of nowhere. It's not like he had multiple votes, right? The other guys yeah. decided not to seek it and he stepped forward and he got it. Um, I don't know on how many ballots it took. I think it was right away. It seemed rather abrupt for me. I didn't hear about it before it was done. And I follow it fairly closely. Everybody just wanted to go home. I think so. But here's my <laughs> thing. I think he actually checked the boxes because he mm. checked the kind of the right all the like fundamentalist evangelical Christian boxes for a lot oh, yeah. of the kind of like really power players. And then all the establishment folks were happy that he wanted to give a fuck ton of money to Israel. And those yeah. things are not exclusive of each other. And that's what we're actually really getting into today is that that kind of like right wing Christian fascism has an element to it that they are Christian Zionists and they are seeking to further, um, escalate conflict into a violent catastrophe in the middle east because by their ideology that ushers in the end of days and the second coming of jesus christ and then a paradise on earth or whatever for a thousand fucking years although don't they all go to heaven so does the paradise really matter ah that's an interesting point that we can touch on later a difference ah. between an older version of apocalyptic cult where they believe they would be raptured and we would all have to deal with the war towards uh di what's called dominionism which is more about like they see themselves having a central role in guiding society that direction by seizing institutions of power by force if necessary 
And that's where you really get into territory of Christian fascism. Because if you're like a Heaven's Gate, like apocalyptic cult, you're really not like, you're really not attempting to see, like it's 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 entirely spiritual or, or interpersonal. And you're not trying to seize like the levers of government to command no, no. the population according to your particular uh, r- uh, religious uh, edicts. And no, in fact, they tend to be people, more. Like, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say they tend to be more insular and don't want lots of people involved because it's hard to maintain the, it's hard to maintain a cult if you have too many people. Mm-hmm. I wonder what the happy number is. secretive because yeah. they know that they'd be persecuted for being different. Yeah. Um, unless I guess your sister wives, because like Brooke is on like season seven of that shit. I didn't even know they had that many fucking seasons of a show. <laughs> so idiotic. No offense to her, but like. The things that they, they fucking sell ads, bro. I don't get it. Yeah. I don't think I ever will understand some of the things that sell ads. You yeah, know what doesn't remember. sell ads? Hmm. Our podcast. It doesn't. It really does. <laughs> because you haven't liked and subscribed. Why haven't you liked and subscribed? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Guilt. So um, we're going to go kind of uh, in as linear as a, a form as we could get into the narrative. Um, We're going to open up and talk briefly about um, the newly elected Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, Um, and then we're going to kind of uh, touch a little bit on Christian Zionism and kind of Christian fascism. Um, We're going to touch a little bit about um, the Christian Zionist or Christian fascist as a kind of apocalyptic cult and talk about some of the elements of that and then connect that back to Israel because this week, and we'll show you a clip. Um, this week, uh, uh, several Israeli officials, including, um, I think they're in, uh, was their ambassador to the U S or some other similar diplomatic, like head of state or something. And then also the prime minister both kind of couched, um, what they're the genocide they're committing mm-hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> in Palestine. Um, they, they wrap that in the same, uh, e- exact same religious terms as, the Christian Zionists um, have. And so they've kind of have this quite explicit understanding that, Hey, we're on the same team guys. Like this is about us bringing in the Holy war. International. And, uh, dog whistles. Say, uh, what's that? I said, it's international dog whistles. Indeed. Right. And we'll talk about it then, but he, uh, he cites specific scripture. That's like at the front of the Christian Zionist um, ideology or, or anticipation of the end times. So let us, Get started if you have nothing else to say. Nothing to do. Let's start off with the World Socialist websites. Yeah. Do you want to read that or you want me to? I'm a little uh, stuffy. I didn't even check in with you. I'm fucking Uh, sick as shit. I I knew it Friday. Some kid uh, breathed on my face. (laughs) And I was like, fuck, bro. I could feel the warmth. And I was like, I'm going to get fucking sick. And sure as shit, two days later, I just like scratchy throat sore throat fucking sinuses exploded fucking kids man can't live with them can't launch them into the sun yeah but you know what we can do is send them into some future holy war meat grinder yeah or the mines either way we're too old we're too old for conscription (laughs) yeah (laughs) we dodged that bullet all right go ahead my friend uh trump backed johnson's mike johnson's campaign to become speaker after previously denouncing the candidacy of tom emmer whom he branded as rhino or republican name only and globalist because emmer had voted to certify biden's election and later supported the passage of a continuing resolution to prevent the shutdown of the federal government on september 30th so you know did reasonable things uh Oh, uh, let's see. Ultimately, it led or uh, it was McCarthy's agreement with the White House um, to pass the continuing resolution uh, that let the government function that uh, led the eight uh, Republicans who voted against him to go ahead and call that in or, or, or call him up for that. Um, and so you've got uh, Johnson now. He's an evangelical Protestant, uh, opposes abortion, homosexuality, uh uh, you know what she calls a perversion, having a pretty light stuff for you know, evangelicals. Uh, his right. wife is a lay pastor. I don't know what that means. Lay pastor. She can't be a real pastor because she's a woman, dude. Oh, uh, okay. Most most likely. I'm not positive, but I think so. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, and the two have recorded a series of podcasts that lay out their extreme religious views. Hell yeah, man. It's a place to be. 
Uh, he uh, touched on this theme in his acceptance uh, a speech in which he cited scripture and the Bible and declared that God has allowed us to be brought here to the specific moment in time. Um, he then cited uh, the 1962 action by the House to put the words in God we trust above the House chamber. Um, he stated that it was to rebuke Cold War era uh, a philosophy of the Soviet Union, uh, Marxism, communism, which were uh, started on the premise that there is no God. I mean, there were Excellent. other ones. Yeah. Um, and then he goes on to kind of uh, do some kind of creationist stuff. Yeah. And, he... and then they debunk it. But I thought it was very interesting. And I wanted to point out because this kind of introduces this character as clearly like a right winger. Right. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really touched on here. And I'm glad that you skipped the word fascist because this is the World Socialist website. And yeah. I actually think they do a pretty, di pretty big disservice to continue to use that word the way they do. Yeah. Because it almost makes it sound sensational. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I, it, it, it's really kind of weakens, weakens what they're saying because they keep saying, and then the eight fascists did this and the fascists did this. Yeah. It just reminds me of that Fox video that we watched, you know, where they were like, Oh yeah. The, the Marxist well, you know, Democrats they're Marxists, well, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I did think it was interesting that, um, cause Emmer, the guy they mentioned who was not supported. Um, I think he was the majority whip. So he actually already held a leadership position in Congress. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Trump is like, no, he's he's what did he call him? He's a uh, weak or whatever because he didn't or he because he voted to certify Biden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was basically that he voted against, you know, my my wishes. <laughs> and so I really don't want to bring this back to Trump, but we have to acknowledge that Trump is going to be the next president. He's the one running. He has 45 percent of the GOP. Biden can't even get fucking his like people are banned like people who were loyal to him are abandoning him because of his uh, uh his complicity in the genocide against Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Um, like people are running away from it. We've discussed that here, our anecdotes or whatnot. And actually, I've seen it talked about in the press too. Is that his poll numbers just continue to tank because yeah. of his fucking leadership is on the he's on the wrong side of everything. I got um, a survey earlier today that asked me like, oh, what do you think of all the things that uh uh you know, president biden did in the or, or did in his first year and you know they just listed off a bunch of stuff and the options were like um haven't heard of disagree haven't heard of support you know have heard of uh you know disagree and have or have heard of uh, or, uh, you know support and like the whole thing just kind of felt like uh not only that they were trying to get an idea of like what people knew but also like put the knowledge out there too to the people taking the survey like hey look into this the guy the guy's doing stuff you know it's not just you know that you know he didn't do any sort of uh uh you know forgiveness for people's uh uh you know, what do you call them uh, uh student loans you know except for like a very small number of people like you know don't ignore all the things that he didn't do look at the few things that he did Right, right, right. As we've discussed here, and there's like so, so limited a number that you hear them repeated over and over, and you can't help but think like, oh, the you know campaign team got together with their people and said, here is our unified message, right? Yeah, which is bullshit. But I, I do want to bring up though that like Mike Johnson, and it, I don't think it said it in that article, or at least not in the part we watched, and I don't think mm -hmm. a clip we're getting to it um, talks about it. But he was instrumental in attempting to overturn Biden's uh, electoral win. So he was like yeah. one of the big pushers for that. So he's he was elected because the Democrats and the establishment Republicans just want to show Israel how much they love Israel because their fucking lobbies are so powerful and have such deep pockets. Right. And then yeah. the right wingers are like, well, that's cool. You like them because you're fucking corrupt. We like them because we're soldiers for fucking the second coming of Jesus. Like, this is a scary fucking position to be in, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, you. you brought something back up. Yeah. Johnson and his backers flatly refused to discuss their campaign to deny uh, Bi or Biden's victory in the 2020 elections. So it got brought up and they're like, ah, no, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, and I actually think at some point I saw an interview or something where someone brought it up, and he he actually cleverly deflected it. 
Um, another amazing thing about this person that scares me is his meteoric rise. I think he might be a useful idiot. He certainly doesn't seem like he has the charisma to be like a figurehead like Trump, right? Yeah. Or even, you know, um, uh, someone else like a, I don't know, Alex Jones or whoever else, right? Um, Matt Gates, like pretty fucking charismatic people, right? Yeah. Um, and Mike Johnson is not charismatic, but he's a technocrat, right? He was a constitutional lawyer who used constitutional law to try and argue against fucking um, gay marriage and against overturning like anti-sodomy laws and uh -huh. um, which I think in, in uh, the way the law defines it, sodomy includes oral sex, which is just like it's anything outside of just vaginal penetration. Yeah. What can yeah, make a baby fucking do that? Wild. Can you believe that? Like <laughs> you're like, you're a criminal because you, you like to fucking, I don't know, fucking <laughs> eat, eat fucking pussy or whatever. Like shit, man. No butt stuff. <laughs> no butt stuff for sure. Not even a finger. You <laughs> degenerate. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I do think it's time to move on, but I did want to point out his relationship with Trump. Trump is a strongman figure who clearly is ill, Ill, or Ill religious, but um, certainly had the religious right on his side oh, in yeah. 2016 and maintained him. And some people are like, you know, and I might have mentioned this before. People are like, oh, Trump never started any wars. No, you know what Trump did do, though, to pre that precipitated exactly what's happening right now? He moved the fucking embassy to Jerusalem. Yeah, he also didn't sign in on the Iran deal for. Oh, yeah, he backed out of the weapons. fucking Iran nuclear yeah, deal. Yeah. A lot of what's happening yeah. right now is his fault. Yeah. Not his fault. I mean, it might have been inevitable, but he certainly didn't fucking. He didn't help. He didn't help the situation. He didn't help. <laughs> Just like, nice. Man, nice can of gas there. I'm just going to flick these matches near it. <laughs> yep. And then he's the fucking French people at that cafe with everything burning around them. This is fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. People? We're going to play a clip from the gray zone where uh, Max Blumenthal uh, continues to expand on the um, past and character of Mike Johnson, the new speaker. And by the way, Speaker of the House, do you know where they fall in the hierarchy in terms of succession for the presidency? Are they like fourth or fifth? Third, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's third. It goes uh, president, vice president, then Speaker of the House. Yeah, and this guy's been in the House for seven years, so it's not exactly. And I saw a headline right before I logged on that said he's going after the Biden family. So it seems uh, like yeah. they might be trying to, I mean, Democrats have been doing it with Trump too, right? Yeah. Um, but it seems like they might be trying to jail their political opponents. Mm -hmm. Which is just fucking everybody in Washington's a fucking fascist. Go ahead and roll the clip. I'm gonna step away for just a sec. Yeah. So he's even leaving open the possibility of authorizing US boots on the ground to fight alongside Israel. A complete clown show. I mean, M Mike Johnson is the embodiment of the clown show of U.S. politics. This is a guy who was the lawyer for the Ark Encounter Creationism Museum <laughs> oh in Kentucky, God. where they teach uh. visitors that man walked along with dinosaurs as in the Flintstones, and they now feature a life-size replica of Noah's Ark uh, in order to teach that the Bible was real. And his first act as speaker was to issue a resolution in support of Israel's assault on Gaza. Nope. And I think he's, what is he, in Israel now? He's on his way there. I don't know. Uh, but complete clowns. And then you have Hakeem Jeffries on the other side, whose entire career was propelled by the Israel lobby. I mean, he wouldn't be there without pro-Israel money. Uh, and so, you know, on, on the theme of... Uh, Republican support for Israel. Israel's UN ambassador, and as you know, we said earlier, Netanyahu's openly catering to their apocalypticist worldview, their eschatology, which sees Israel as the future landing pad for the Messiah following a horrible war, uh, which includes Gog and Magog from Re the book of Revelations, which they see as Russia and Iran. Uh, you had the UN ambassador, Gilad Erdan, actually visit the largest Christian Zionist pro-apocalypse church in the U.S. Uh, to frame this war as a religious war. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Um, one day we're probably going to have a religion based on Tolkien 
because like you know we'll have the Cimmerillion and everybody will get like super confused after like a really big war and someone will be like oh this is like a holy text cool where are the elves <laughs> like people will fucking buy anything <laughs> it's disturbing so so one thing I, I did want to push back so and I I yeah. think he changes his tone a little bit later in the show right. um but he kind of begins with being like, oh, look at this fucking guy who was elected as a fucking clown in a clown car, right? Yeah. And I think it's really dangerous to dismiss people who believe wacky shit like creationism. Mm -hmm. I personally think it's absolutely fucking dangerous to dismiss that as wacky instead of seeing it for what it is in context. This is the third person in line for the fucking presidency. And that's problematic, not because he believes in creationism, but because his belief in creationism is indicative of a greater um, willingness to abandon logic, reason, and all the gifts of the fucking enlightenment, yeah. right? Yeah. For a particular, like, really fringe religious ideology that's hell bent on mass murder. Because that's right. what the fucking apocalyptic cult is about. It's like, it all ends and we're victorious. Like, it's fucking scary that this man is one of the most powerful fucking people. And the way the Democrats are acting, the way they've all fallen in line, the way that even the ones who are supposed to be champions for fucking human rights have all fucking basically fallen in line because, well, it's an election year and we can't, like, hurt Joe Biden, even though he's perfectly capable of hurting himself. Right. And uh, there's there's no fucking allies. And that this is how the liberals, the middle liberals actually are more responsible for fascism than any other political faction in the country. So I think it was the liberals in fucking Germany that were responsible for the rise of Hitler because they said, yeah. oh, he's kooky. Oh, he's kind of fringing out there. Oh, you know, everything's fine. Our economic policies are helping people ignoring all of the fucking data and failing to just like walk the fucking street and talk to someone and ask them four fucking questions about their life. Right. They're right, so goddamn right. out of touch that they really believe that everything's going to be fine if they just keep doing it the way they are. And all the while underneath the surface and even, even quite above the surface bubbling up like fissures, right? Like fucking, you know, uh, gas vents or whatever is this fucking fascist current. That's ready to explode like a goddamn super volcano. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was going to save it for later, but I think a lot of it just has to do with how uh, you've basically got a bunch of people that have run out of ideas and in, in order to make anything better. And they just know that they want some future that isn't what it is right now. And unfortunately, they're the ones most willing to use violence to attain that. Like, when you have, you know, Democrats and stuff like that, like they'll do anything to not use violence against, uh, and I'm not just talking physical violence, but like, you know, rhetorical violence against their enemies. You know, they just kind of like sit back and they're like, oh, well, you know, let them do what they're going to do when they're in charge and we'll undo it when we get in. And it's like, yeah, and you spend all your time undoing, you never get to make any progress either. So, you know, yeah, and you're right. Effectual parties. Yeah, we discussed it last week, and I really think that's kind of a central, if we were to like, take all these discussions and boil them down to like a few fucking key truths yeah. of our particular political moment and historical moment um, and spiritual moment in a lot of ways is that like the re one of the reasons that fucking liberals fail is because they're like, they play civility politics. Yeah. And they're like, Oh no, we're not going to sink to their level. Why? Politics is a fucking blood sport, god damn it. Yeah. We're not gonna we're not gonna bring a you know uh we're not gonna sink to their level, we're gonna hold the high ground, yeah. we're gonna be better than them. And you're like the thing is, is that they will fucking trash talk you super fucking hardcore and very effectively. As soon as you turn around, they play victim, and then you're like, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Fuck their feelings, they know exactly what they're doing, and guess what? They get everything they want. Mm-hmm. And we get nothing. Not that not that the liberal party is fucking represents me, but you know what I mean? It gets nothing that it wants. If it wants yeah. anything at all, who knows what the fuck? It's so fucking dead. Well, the thing right? is they can't want anything because uh, all the things that their constituents want are like 
basic shit and they don't want to give it to us it goes against capitalism uh, yeah because it goes capital. against capitalism you know, we're just like hey it sure would be nice if i didn't have to worry about like food clothing and housing so that i could focus all my efforts on other things like maybe inventing a bunch of stuff for your cool country but no instead i'm busy and i work at a fucking school you know cleaning up you know, pissing shit you know for the students instead of like teaching in it like goodwill hunting <laughs> Exactly. So let's move on. There's another clip from the gray zone. Let's push through this. We're we're most likely running over now. Or actually, I can almost guarantee that yeah. the withdrawal that had been announced by Donald Trump. Withdrawal from Syria. they're not supposed to be yes. here, be there. There was supposed True. to be a withdrawal, and they sabotaged it. Uh, was it Jim Jeffries? These these Jim Jeffries, yeah, who was Trump's envoy to Syria. He even admitted that he lied to the White House about the number of U.S. forces inside Syria to mislead them and to uh, get around Trump's order for them to withdraw. Um, the entire Pentagon leadership basically stonewalled Trump. He's supposed to be the commander in chief. Whatever you think of him, he was elected. He's supposed to be a chain of command. Uh, and Trump ordered a withdrawal from Syria and Pentagon leadership and Trump's own envoy ignored it. So that doesn't surprise me though. What's that? Oh, that, you know, there's, I mean, people with their own agendas who just technically I didn't. Hey, Mr. President, you said withdraw 100,000 troops. I just you know told you there were only 100,000 troops. You know, I might have miscalculated. <laughs> you know. I honestly view this and, and part of the reason I wanted to play that clip is because we also and maybe you can bring that up next. I know it's at the bottom of our list, but mm. it's right here. There's an NPR article at the bottom okay. of the yeah. tracker. If you want to prep that for next uh, when we play it. Um, but anyway, I think that it's really important because it, it is it is that there are individuals in uh, in in the executive that push back against the president. To outright say, mm, no, nope, we're going to do our own thing. And what you want really doesn't matter is a a violation of the fucking Constitution. They have no constitutional power to act without the president. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, as far as I know, I'm not a constitutional attorney, but I think that's how it works. That if the president says do something, the executives are subservient. Pretty sure that's how it fucking works. <laughs> but this is what people call the deep state. Interestingly enough, the people who complain loudest about the deep state are the ones who want the deep state the most, because those people would be like, yes, we have this holy war. And Trump says pull out, but Trump is not committed to the holy war. So he doesn't quite understand. He's not a bad man. He's still our leader, right? But yeah. he doesn't just get this. So we're going to do it for him because we know the right thing to do is to stay in the region. Then we had what, 21, 22, something, uh, a number, a, a few dozen, maybe uh, military contractors and servicemen who got mm. attacked at military bases by various uh, uh, insurgents groups and other kind of like um, paramilitary organizations mm -hmm. because we're still there. And why are we still there? Because we never finished the job in Syria and Iran was still on our hit list. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, uh, Iran and Syria were on the hit list, Lebanon too. Um, and this is our moment to fucking to turn the table and uh install all of our puppet regimes and who knows what the fuck it looks like we talked about bricks last time mm -hmm. saudi saudi officials are coming to meet uh in the u.s over the next few days who knows what the fuck happens but i think we're grabbing for oil and i think we're, yeah. we still hold a grudge against iran for fucking kicking out our puppet dictator way back when <laughs> when they held their revolution and we actually created it was a secular society and by mm -hmm. installing a fucking dictator the only political faction that was able to rally the people around a revolutionary movement to oust the puppet dictator was the fucking Islamists. Yeah. So we made Iran a theocracy. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, they're a theocracy. It's a religious thing. And Christians and Mus or Christians and Jews have to work together to defeat the Muslims. Like it's the fucking crusades. Yeah. Like it's not fucking 1100, bro. <laughs> it is in their mind. I know, but in their, it's fucking absurd. And yeah. all of this is in the context of resource depletion and climate change. Right? I mean, any, species extinction. I mean, it basically sounds like scarcity. Just, 
Sorry, this is a ahead. pretty. No, I mean it's a pretty normal reaction to finding out, you know, that all the shit's going to hell. Is you gather up your troops and you yep. rally them in order to get whatever is left. And in this instance, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Like, why? <laughs> I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people in the government that are like, why is Christian oil under Muslim land? And so the answer, of course, is to destroy all the Muslims so that it's now Christian oil. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's move on to this uh, article from NPR real quick, just to kind of uh, lend a little bit more weight to what Max Blumenthal said about um, about people on Trump's team basically enacting the evangelical like Christian Zionist uh, agenda against Trump's wishes, even though he's the chief executive and ultimately his his decisions should have been implemented. Um, and it's actually at the bottom of it. There's a um, a uh, pie chart. chart and a couple other things. There's no pie chart. Here you go. So this is um, faith in the military. This is not uh, indicative of the entire population of the military, but this just shows how far the U.S. military. I think this article was printed in 2005, and this data is from that is correct, time, yeah. maybe 2003, 2004. So this is outdated. But when I was in basic training, I attended Muslim service just because it was held at a different time and I wanted to be edgy and different um, and because they couldn't tell me no because I had religious freedom. Um, <laughs> and I was pushing that because that's I went in the military as a 25-year-old man with a college degree, so yeah. I knew what I was fucking doing. Um, Do what I want. Uh, but at any rate, um, I did the very first week go to the evangelical service that everybody continued to go to the whole time. And it was an evangelical service. And this is a, a graph that just shows that uh, uh, evangelical, which is this kind of like far right parts of the evangelical movement um, are, are borderline and or explicitly Christian fascist. Um, and uh, the, they make up the not only a, a, a solid uh, plurality of service persons, but also a majority, a, a solid majority of the chaplaincy. So when you need to see a chaplain for some kind of spiritual or interpersonal or psychological issue, you right. just need someone to talk to um, in um, confidence or whatever, that person is more likely than not to be an evangelical and give you advice from a perspective that says we need to have a holy war for the second coming of Jesus. Right. That's in our United States military. So yeah. when, when Max Blumenthal says, oh, well, the Pentagon just kind of advanced the the agenda that most benefited fucking Israel, despite Trump wanting to withdraw troops from Syria, this is why they're doing it, is because they've infiltrated our military. They've infiltrated, like, Trump's envoy. They've infiltrated the fucking White House and the executive branch. Clearly, they're in Congress. The most powerful person in Congress is a member of this fucking movement. Yep. And here the mainline Protestants would be your kind of like other, you know, Presbyterians and other people who have like their own liturgies and shit, but aren't kind of like batshit crazy. They're like yeah. the kinds of Christians. And then even Catholics, bro, Catholics make up a big chunk because there's Filipinos, there's Hispanics, right? There's people of like Irish descent and other Irish people descent, who are, yeah. come from Roman Catholic backgrounds. And the chaplaincy is even less. So that's not even proportional. Yeah. And many of us <laughs> no preference is atheists and other people who are like, I declined to state. Cause like yeah. you, you, did you get issued dog tags in the Navy or did you get like a little floaty with your ID and information on it? No, 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 we get dog tags. Okay. No religious preference. Yep. No religious preference. Cause if you die, they want to know how to fucking dispose of your body. Yeah. Well, the thing it's is like neo pagan. Religious... It'd be like yeah. funeral pyre or excarnation by fucking buzzard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or burial at sea would be pretty good. I think uh, Islam is burial at sea is preferred, right? Yeah. I mean, excarnation sounds fun, but also I'd be you know, pretty cool if they could just like throw them in the ocean, you know, like launch one of the missiles at my body so that my funeral you know, costs like a million dollars. You want them to fucking duct tape your body to a missile. <laughs> no, it wouldn't fit in the tube probably with your body strapped to the outside. <laughs> I imagine that's pretty tight, just like a gun, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to bring that up because that's old. So this is not a new phenomena and it's only gotten worse. I know a couple of my commanders because I had heard about this and I read articles about it. And I noticed that like some of my commanders would like go to these like prayer breakfasts. I'm yeah. like, oh shit. And these are like light colonels, colonels, guys with like fucking, you know, a, a line or, or um, a good chance at getting a fucking general star. Yeah. Maybe becoming a brigadier general or whatever, right? Like these were high ranking people, plus tons of lieutenants and majors, captains. So a lot of military and a lot of uh, the NCO Corps, a lot of the um, 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 MPs also kind of came from this background. People who yeah. like were going in because they wanted to get combat training. We're going to talk a little bit about that here at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. what that means and kind of this this these people who've been going through and getting uh trained up uh to be uh, military combatants while adhering and, and also getting military training in a context that is also reinforcing all this like christian fascist uh uh tendency or ideology yeah um we have a quick, a uh, couple little quips here from the Real News Network, Chris Hedges' show. There, I did want to just offer a caveat because this is something I saw in a, um, in I think it was a YouTube or it might have been even a Reddit thread or something when I was putting stuff together for the show. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, someone was like, "Well, why do you always say Christian fascists and you never call Muslims fascists?" And so I just wanted to point out, like, when. Uh, there were Muslim fascists, we ISIS or Daesh or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. I think that most people were very comfortable calling them Islamo fascist. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think there was much hesitation. And the point being is that, like, we're not saying all Christians are fascists. What we're saying is that there are Christian fascists. Um, just as not all Muslims are fascists, but there have been islamo fascist groups like isis right mm. um and so i think that's a really uh important distinction is that when you say christian fascist some people might recoil and say oh my god what are you trying to say but what we mean is it's, like handmaid's tale right it's, it's also built into the religion like you are afraid of god you do what he says that's fascism god's a fascist oh yeah and generally people yeah. who tend to be right wing or religious generally um are also like on a scale when given assessments and shit tend to be more authoritarian or yeah. much more comfortable with authoritarian. It's the basis of the ironic religion. considering they call themselves the freedom caucus and the Republicans yeah. are always like, we're the party of freedom. It's like, wait a second. Then why are like a vast majority, like the most of your members like really religious? Yeah. Where like because, there's like, 10 commandments, AKA 10 things that someone's telling you, you can and can't do. Right. It's just it's interesting that we're like the party of freedom, but yet like our whole doctrine is to like submit to a greater power. So how yeah. can you be for freedom and then also be like, we're for freedom, but we want to submit? There's some. There's every last one of them. Every last one of them. I've, I've heard this. Probably bottoms, too. I've heard this, too. <laughs> conversations with. Uh, yeah, conversations. We'll have to have a whole episode on that. I don't really Tune in to... Thursday, shooting the poodoo or shooting it up the poodoo. Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo! All right, we're going to move on to uh, Chris Hedges here. There's a church, a, a militia church in Omaha, Nebraska, in the book, uh, more diverse than any church around here where I live in Vermont, about a third people of color, um, and a full on Civil War church. They, they look forward to Civil War, they are armed. They are ready, bring it on. Uh, they are fairly openly white supremacists. They preach relentlessly against Black Lives Matter as a metaphor for blackness itself. And yet they've drawn in. Fascism has gravity. Fascism has power. And if we recognize it as such, it shouldn't be that surprising to us that this iteration in America in 2023 is not quite the same racial purity project as happened in germany 19 you know 33. Well, i think you make the point that it's it's defined more by feelings or the embrace of what they describe as white victimization 
as long as you embrace that, it doesn't matter what color you are. Yeah. And in fact, actually, in the martyr role that Trump uh, uses of people killed by uh, undocumented um, undocumented folks, he, he often talks uh, about a young, very promising black football player. Um, and uh, in a sense, you know, bringing this guy in under the umbrella of whiteness. But this <laughs> the umbrella of whiteness. I like. That yeah. Term. So. This was a fucking we put everything in the show notes. The gray zone interview we showed before was good. I think there's two uh two hedges clips. There are, there are. Sorry, I'm doing something. Oh, my bad. My bad. Yeah, keep um, <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I think everybody definitely needs to check out this interview. It really kind of goes deep on the Christian fascism side of things. Yeah. Interestingly enough, like he's kind of like he's he's bringing up the kind of propensity for violence aspect mm -hmm. um and i think he mentioned he mentioned trump right or or something like that he's talking about these people are gravitating towards and they're they're oh uh, oh he called them the martyr uh or called him the martyr uh basically in his role of constantly being assaulted now with uh charges against him yep yeah, 100 yeah, percent. Yep, yeah. he fills the martyr role yeah, one hundred percent. I think in this interview they also talk about what's her name, the woman who died uh, trying to break through the Capitol. Um, she got shot or something, and mm. died. Uh, they kind of talked about her as a martyr. They always have their martyrs, right? Like, yeah. I mean, most of January sixth, I saw it from coming from people on the left who, like, I largely lost respect for, which is why I don't like fucking the convo couch. And in most ways, like, I don't really watch much Jimmy Dore either. Because mm -hmm. they both got on this like apologetics for January 6th being like, oh, well, it was just an inside job. Like the feds set them all up. And I was like, the feds did not go onto everybody's private social media and post that they were there to storm the Capitol to overturn the election. Like, yeah, sure. You could say that, like, the cops didn't put up a big enough presence to push back against this. Mm -hmm. Some footage I saw showed that they did try. They were fucking outnumbered. Now you can go deeper and say, well, they must have did it on purpose. They must have short staffed it because they wanted them to do this to take away our liberties. That you might argue they could have not taken it serious too. guess who else didn't take it serious. Fucking Israel. When Hamas came across the border and fucking started taking people as bargaining chips. <laughs> right. Like Israel probably could expect that shit to happen. They probably didn't expect it to happen the way it did. And at the scale yeah. that it did, because incursions from fucking Palestinians, Hamas or or, uh, or otherwise independent <laughs> freelancers, I guess you could say, were probably fairly commonplace and fairly benign. Yeah. Right. Ended fairly quickly. This was a lot more organized than they had anticipated. In a lot of ways, when you think your enemy is an, an, an animal, an unthinking animal. Right. You, you don't give them enough fucking uh, uh, enough. Uh, um credit you know enough space to actually believe that they're capable of doing something so intelligently organized because mm. you think they're subhuman and that yeah. they're incapable of fucking rational thought jokes on well, you that, they're quite rational well and um, that goes back on to you earlier saying how like don't dismiss people as you know crazy or anything like that like no. they're very finely focused they just happen to have different beliefs but like they're not you know like wackadoo they are Oh yeah, thinking, thinking hard. Guess what? Yeah, dude, you can think that creationism is fucking insane. I personally think the Ark Museum is a little much. I think it's a little crazy. Yeah, it's like the world's biggest ball of string to me, though. Like, yeah, it's like it's a novelty that I will never ever care to pay to see. I have been to the world's largest collect. No, I didn't. I saw a sign for the world's largest kaleidoscope. <laughs> Don't we have like one of the 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 country's biggest fucking yo-yo museums here? Probably. Oh, yeah, she feels like a big fucking yo-yo thing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a yo-yo museum, and I've never yeah. been in there once. I've no. lived in this city for like ten or fifteen years or whatever. Because it's weird, and who the hell cares? <laughs> who gives a shit about yo-yos? Well, some people do. I I have friends whose kids are fucking. There are really dozens of them. Literally dozens. They're really good at yo, and you're like, God damn. But you know what? You're in America, and you'll never beat the Chinese, bro. They're just two <laughs> disciplines. And I've seen some fucking Chinese kids on TikTok. They can fucking yo-yo better than the best yo-yo here I've ever seen. 
Like fingers. They're, they're so damn nimble. They, they're just their parents. They're just too, uh, too hard ass, you know, tiger mama or whatever. Like yeah. Forcing the kids to practice yo-yo fucking eight get, hours. Get better or I'll kill you and have a better child. <laughs> I only get one. <laughs> You're disposable. Fuck off. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's not what it's really like. But the Chinese kids are really good at yo-yo. Um, okay, great. So there's another clip of this uh, 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 real news with Chris Hedges. To what you say, though, about there not being this counter force like in Weimar, Germany. I mean, there is a scene in the book where in Sacramento at a rally for Ashley Babbitt, Antifa and Proud Boys show Oops. up to battle and they kind of all know each That's other. Um, and it's a kind of a ridiculous fight, although I wouldn't have wanted. That's the, wrong time. That's the wrong time. Okay, um, real quick, though, I wanted to say yeah. that wasn't just a kind of fucking fake fight. I remember that happening because, like, I don't know people in Sacramento Antifa, but, like, been kind of adjacent. I actually went to, as a solidarity action, I went to a court hearing for some of the defendants when mm -hmm. that happened. Those fucking Proud Boys, like, stabbed four people. Ah. Yeah, the right winger stabbed four people. And I was there in solidarity with fucking um, uh, other participants in that brawl. Uh, yeah. Many of which had been doing a lot of anti fascist work. And that was being brought up by the court. Is mm -hmm. it like one of them I remember distinctly? And I don't want to give too much detail, but I mean, it's a court record, so it's fucking public. But there was one woman who. Um, who, like the court was like, you already like Alameda County banned you from fucking participating in shit like this. <laughs> or like basically said, like, you're on thin ice, don't fucking do this. And then she yeah. came to Sacramento County and did it. She's like, Sacramento County didn't say shit. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate. Yeah, no, so I went to a court case as a, as a solidarity action with folks who were at that event. It was not a fake fight, as he says. Like, people yeah. got fucking stabbed. I didn't even mean to show that. So, oh, a great, a great and I story. Forgot that he had mentioned that because I listen to this shit while I'm like gardening and stuff, so yeah. I don't catch every detail. Yeah, um, yeah, I have the same problem. But yeah, it was actually a really nice day. Went to the courthouse. Um, I rode down there with my roommate and friend at the time, um, Yamo Aqua, um, who's an indigenous organizer, and then um, had lunch with my dad because he was still working at the um, at Calpers. And there's a little Mexican restaurant a couple blocks from his office. So we left the courthouse and I went down there. I had lunch with him and shit. Talked to him. He's like, why are you here? He's like, yeah, at the courthouse, hanging out with fucking, as a solidarity action with some fucking Sacramento Antifa. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, carry on, carry on. He's like, great. Come on, play. Civil War. Um, I, I've covered civil wars. Uh, and I don't see the... It, uh, I think it, in some ways, from my perspective, it's even more frightening. It's it's less a civil war because there, it's not like uh, Weimar Germany where you had armed communist militias battling brown shirts in the streets. Uh, it, it, it's, it's more the uninterrupted rise of heavily armed fascist, proto-fascist, Trump supporters, uh, uh, when it was small arsenals in their homes, and uh, and those who 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 don't have any violent counterpart. Yeah, uh, you know, um, you've covered civil wars. Uh, uh, I accidentally, as a younger person, stumbled through one in Algeria, and and I know that this is not that, and I am aware of the you know the the risk of hyperbole using this this. This phrase I use in my subtitle scenes from a slow civil war, a slow civil war. And it's my way of thinking about it. And in 2021, what I started noticing was academic historians who are very cautious, rightly so. They understand the history moves slowly. I'm married to a, an academic historian. I understand <laughs> this and I think it's the right way. Starting to say, oh, some of the conditions of an actual civil war here. And that's that that language had always been there uh, on the, mostly on the fringe of the right. Um, but now it was moving as a rhetorical ploy more centrally. And I started thinking about uh, the ways, how could we understand uh, slow civil war as a kind of an institutionalization of violence? I think uh, the laws um, 
for instance, I write about this in, in the book. Uh, I was in Wisconsin when Roe fell, which became the first, the only blue state in which abortion was completely outlawed. It reverted to 1849 law. Um, and you would hear these stories in the press of uh, a woman who nearly bled out or bled out or or something else went horrible happened because she couldn't get access to reproductive care. And as journalists, we know for every story like that we hear, there's a lot that don't mm -hmm. go reported. And I said, there's a way in which, uh, you know, more harm now is being done than all the abortion clinic bombers. It's very easy to see an abortion clinic bomber. And there was a lot more of that than people realized as, as a kind of, a, a, at least a desire to mm -hmm. spark civil war. And yet here it is. And I thought of the ways that you have these armed militias, these groups of men who line up outside school libraries and churches and bars having drag shows and so on. And there's been a few shots fired, not many. Um, and so people can say, well, come on now, there's, nothing's really happening. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. this is like we're, we're, we're striking matches and flicking them into dry grass. And so far the flames haven't caught. And so we think everything's fine. How many times can you line up a group of men with guns to what you said? I fucking love that metaphor mm -hmm. <laughs> so much. Cause like, yeah. you know, you're like trying to strike a match and little sparks come off, but it doesn't light. Yeah. That's such a fucking phenomenal metaphor of just striking a match into dry grass and it's not yet caught but yeah. inevitably it will right yeah and yeah. i think that's really important because that's kind of part of the context of this christo fascist when we talk about uh moving from and i think they talk about it, uh, dominionism here a little bit in this clip don't they uh in yes the coming up clip yep okay great so then we'll we'll just save that but just keep that in yep. mind um and maybe we should have flipped these in in hindsight. Um, no, there's kind of this like part of it. We talked about the speaker getting elected, right? This being uh, a movement that not only has a ton of elected officials, but it has a, a lot of unelected officials in the in the military and in the executive and other uh, uh, bureaucratic apparatus, where these individuals are enacting their plan with or without um, a democratic process as prescribed by the constitution and law, mm -hmm. right? And they're just kind of doing what they need to do to advance their agenda quietly or in the public. And it's been slow and, you know, um, the takeover of the Supreme Court, which, you know, I always maintain the court was our last fucking uh, uh, institution with integrity. I think I declared here a number of months ago, maybe a year ago, that like, I no longer believe that. <laughs> I believe that it's been captured and, and much of the lower courts have been captured too by uh absolute fucking batshit crazy fucking Christian fundamentalists. Um and and so we have this 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 setting where there's a bunch of armed people who are pushing towards war. They're mm -hmm. doing these things. I've I've been witness here, I've been at city council meetings where they come out with like, and just are able to vastly outnumber everybody else. And they're aggressive and they're violent. Like they're in your face screaming at you when you're trying to do like, you know, of course what we do is kind of try and find some kind of w way to like really dig at someone quietly, you know, by like making an art installation of like Facebook fucking posts from people and like <laughs> putting all of their hateful fucking words right up in front of them. They don't give a shit. They're right oh. there in your face, screaming, spitting on your face, fucking, you know, they're they blocking traffic, honking on horse, fucking police department doesn't give a shit. Well, nope. That's part I of even, I even made a speech at the proceeding, uh, following city council meeting after that particular event where it got really fucking like many people actually left because they're like, I don't feel safe here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is at a city council meeting. Yeah. In a fucking relatively small town, um, which I think is actually where a lot of that is the worst um, is in small towns and big cities. You don't see it quite so bad. Um, but yeah, at the next city council meeting, I literally read the code where it's like, hey, this is these are all fucking infractions and you did nothing to like actually enforce the fucking law because yeah. ultimately they were here for you and you were here for them. Yeah. 
And that's all part of the institutionalization of violence that he was speaking of. The mm -hmm. idea that they push the line and so that becomes normal for them. You know, you have school violence and that's become normal for us. You've got uh, uh, you know, police enforced violence. That's normal for us. Stand your ground laws in Florida. That's normal for us. We just get bombarded by the normalization of violence by almost exclusively the right and don't push back on it. I was... Uh, I saw a survey where 40% of people didn't think that we could solve gun violence. Like the answer is easy. You just don't have guns, but like they Boo. didn't even think that that was, Boo. I understand, but I'm saying that would be a very easy way to do it. And <laughs> they don't even believe that you could do that. Well, I think that uh, they might say, I don't believe it. It's politically feasible and we don't want to get too sidetracked, but I do really yeah. appreciate that Chris Hedges mentioned that. Yeah, because that's another thing that I continue to mention over and over as one of these. If we want to summarize the things we talk about and 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 what our our, our opinion is, the left also has a fucking problem of not mm. really preparing for anything. Yeah, like yeah, not they preparing don't to fight back. They at disproportionately all, don't own weapons. They don't tra yeah. certainly don't train. Like there's a lot of fucking people who would call themselves liberal or Democrat that have a handgun or whatever. Like yeah. they're not averse to, to gun ownership. They might not think that people should have like, you know, kitted out fucking semi-automatics, which is a little weird because when you actually break down mass shooting statistics, far more mm -hmm. mass shootings happen with fucking handguns and fucking rifles. Uh, just FYI, like a lot mm -hmm. more. Because um, mass shooting is defined as a, a three or four uh, or more injured, depending on which metric you use. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot more handgun mass mass shootings. Um, but my point being is that, uh, yeah, we're not trained, right. And mm -hmm. it's very, there's a very, uh, disproportionate element that right-wing Christians are armed and they have food supplies and they have medical supplies and they have, uh, been accumulating skills as medics, as, uh, uh land navigators, right? Like overland land navigators or whatever mm -hmm. else. And they have their mechanics. Um, I was thinking like, Think of most trades, right? That that would be really important during a wartime, and the vast majority of those people involved in those trades are mm -hmm. part have been been absorbed into this right wing movement. Yeah. What do we have? Fucking, I can design a car dealership's interior. I can I make can beer. choose pouches for a new car dealership. Yeah, yeah. What the fuck? How is that going to fucking help us fight off the fascists? And the reality is, is they don't even want to think of the fucking fascist problem. And what's no, that's that's confrontation. And I think most people who who t uh, attend towards the left are non-confrontational. They're they, they're fucking neutered by civility politics and they are neutered by a commitment to fucking a uh, naive commitment to nonviolent principles because yeah. they've been told that if you're a lefty, we got to protest nonviolently. Mm -hmm. Guess what the right doesn't do? The right yeah, says that. power flows from the barrel of the gun. We don't do this nonviolence bullshit. And even Chris Hedges right there is being like, we're fucking outgunned and nobody on our side gives a shit. Mm -hmm. Like we were absolutely at the mercy of these fucking monsters that yeah. want to make it illegal for you to fucking eat a pussy and <laughs> or get a finger in your ass or right. whatever. Okay. Else. okay. Well, now you've gone too far, sir. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm I'm being a bit I'm not trying to be hyperbolic per se, but like that's but the are. reality. We yeah, are we're prepared exactly to is. fucking push back against this shit. Yeah, and so, as we've seen, don't think that the military is going to help you because they're on the same side. Precisely. Let's yeah. talk just a little bit more about this movement. Just With a some bit. A, old David Pakman clip. I think this is actually quite old, isn't it? Uh, it is. It is a newer video in which he does a clip of himself. Back and back to be like, I've been talking about this for a long time. Yeah. Which is funny because we do it all the time. It's like, yeah, we do. about a year and a half ago, we said this shit. Yeah. All right, go exactly. ahead. Tell me a little bit about NAR. What do those letters stand for? And what is this movement? New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, this is a movement that's really growing in the religious right. It's led by uh, self-pronounced apostles and prophets, and is dramatically changing both Sounds the familiar. structure of many churches uh, that form what we would call the larger religious right or evangelical right, and also uh, much of the ideology 
of these uh, churches and ministries. Uh, the major factor uh, about this movement is that they believe that they have to take dominion over government and society before Jesus can return, which is a very different idea uh, than has been popular in American fundamentalism for many generations, where it was believed that the, the true believers would be taken from the earth before the end of time and before right. Jesus' return. Right, so that right. latter yeah, part would kind of be like this rapture idea, right? Which yes. is at a certain exactly. point, uh, there will be a selection made, so to speak, and some people will be able to live the, for eternity, presumably, Those in heaven, and then everybody else will David. perish. Is that roughly yeah. accurate? Get to go to heaven. That's and roughly else accurate. And of course, in that scenario, all of the really terrible in time wars and so forth take place after the believers have been raptured to heaven. <laughs> of course. This scenario is quite different. In this scenario, the believers are still on earth as these things are happening. So I think this is part of what's adding to what we could say the, the uh, end times hysteria that we are seeing in parts of society. So the believers will be left on the earth in order to, to fight evil and to fight the Antichrist themselves. Fight yeah. evil in the Antichrist. Fight evil in abortion. Fight evil in gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Fight evil in... I mean, I don't like fucking Joe Biden, but I also believe, like, as fucked up as our system is, I genuinely think he would have won. Because I genuinely thought he won in 2016. I knew he was going to win when in the Democratic National Convention in, what was that, August? Or fucking June or July or whatever it was? Yeah, I knew he was going to fucking win. Well, they didn't give anybody else the uh, space to talk. Well, and I saw, yeah. I saw the weaknesses of Hillary Clinton, just like in 2020. I saw how fucking bad Trump botched COVID and how they were successfully able to message that. Yeah. Because, because Trump was, they basically handicapped him from being able to do his big rallies. Mm -hmm. And I do think COVID was a thing, but it is also convenient that that's the purpose it done. And right now they're preventing him. He's still doing rallies, but he's in court so much. He's not able to campaign nearly as much. And I he has to stay they're... mum on a lot of stuff. And I genuinely think they might just be like, the court says, oh, you're not allowed to run. Because if they're just like, oh, he's guilty of these things, that's not going to keep people from not voting for him. Yeah. It's not. The, the people who would vote for him do not care if he gets convicted of something. No, not at all. What they're going to try and do is say, oh, you can't run because you have these like felonies or whatever. And I also think that could inevitably trigger something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you of course. Like, and... You're denying our ability to vote for the person we want to. Yeah. And you've been after it since the very beginning. And it's hard to argue that like this just came naturally. Like it's clearly vindictive. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, I was just going to say I would I would really hope that if a felon can't vote, a, a felon also can't be the president. That's just a hope of mine. I don't know that that's true. Yeah, and then here we go. Maybe Mike Johnson will get fucking Joe Biden convicted of a felony because he, I mean, most of the evidence points to the fact that he actually used his position as vice president to get his son fucking jobs in the Ukraine mm -hmm. with Burisma Energy, et cetera, so forth. Yeah. Right. So like it's all fucking corrupt and I'm all for getting rid of the corruption, but the way it's being used now is just weaponized against political opponents. It's not really being like this one Democrat in New Jersey is probably the cleanest one because like no one saw it coming and they fucking put together a really great case against him for peddling influence with Egypt mm. right? and taking bribes and shit. They yeah. put together the case and then they fucking indicted him. And it's like, mm, nope. It's not really politically motivated because no one was even thinking about that fucking dude when you brought charges, right? Like, yeah. um, that that's legit, legit, like you know, uh, holding, uh, rooting out corruption and holding uh, people accountable. Uh, let's finish this David Beckman stuff. We cert we certainly find Christian end times prophecy uh, dating back many hundreds of years as part of the Crusades and other historical events. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of American. Uh, specifically American fundamentalist uh, end time ideas. Uh, there's a narrative that dates back about 150 years, the narrative mm -hmm. that we were discussing about the believers being raptured before right. the end. Now, the shift that we're talking about, a dramatic shift in American end times 
theology has taken place, let's say, over about the last 30 to 40 years. And and I would say accelerating rapidly in the last 10 to 15 years to what we call dominionism or this belief that that these uh, this particular brand of christianity must take control over society and mm-hmm. government that is yeah 100% so now we know why Reagan. um did mike johnson is so dangerous a speaker and it's so interesting that like nobody in congress they're just fucking oblivious even the like mainstream republicans the ones that Trump would call rhinos, mm-hmm. right? But basically centrists, right? So neocon, neoliberals, right? Um, which make up a majority of the the ideological position in Congress, right? Um, because it's like almost all Democrats, if not all Democrats, and then like most Republicans, and then there's a hand handful of Republican fringe. We have nobody on the left, nobody, not one person. Mm-hmm. Maybe on this issue, the Palestinian issue, we have, I think there was 10 that voted against uh, some resolution sucking Israel's fucking dick, right? The yeah. 10 people that voted against it or abstained or whatever it was. Like, okay, they don't form much of an opposition and they've been unwilling on everything else we've wanted, like minimum wage and health care and everything else. They've been unwilling to deliver the things that people need to kind of prevent this flashpoint where now we have these motherfuckers who are armed, trained, have stockpiles of food and have a religious fucking motivation to seize control of the institutions of power to punish us and make our society pure for the second coming of Jesus. And they're all sitting by and they're fucking oblivious. Or when I try and bring it up to people, they don't want to fucking hear it. Because fascism is scary. They don't want to be on the receiving end of a fascist government. Well, that you're either going to be on the receiving end of, of, of the discipline of a fascist fucking government, or you're going to be on the receiving end of a fascist fucking bullet. You can either fucking live free and die on your feet or fucking, you know, submit and die on your knees. Not dying is not a choice. We all die. Sorry, I'm being a little dramatic. It's powerful. I'm not going to die. Ain't nobody gonna cry today Cause ain't nobody gonna die today I did look up that song <laughs> You looked it up <laughs> I want to teach it to the kids Cause oh, like in Waldorf okay. they like sing songs As they go in and they're all these like Waldorfy folk songs And I want to fucking I want to teach the kids a pop song to sing as they go into the class I don't think that has I don't think that That has any cussing in it You might be able to get away with well, it Well no we would just do the chorus and we would modify oh, okay. it. We wouldn't say homies and we wouldn't say mommies. Okay. It's like all my friends are going to ride today and all my friends are looking fly today. Yeah. Instead of homies and mommies. And then ain't nobody going to cry today because ain't nobody going to die today. I think is appropriate. Yeah. Um, even though like as days go by, the risk of them actually dying increases um, every day. It's very, it's very important for children to know about death as early as possible. Yeah. But I like that kids like basically, uh, because these kids, like, they're just, you know, they're kids. So they have these emotional, and this is a way big divergence from what we're talking about. But they have this kind of emotional response to kind of relatively, like, minor things. Mm-hmm. Because they're still trying to figure out emotional regulation and all these other things. Because they're kids. Um, and I just like that line. Because um, it's like, hey, like, nothing that's going to happen here is fucking that bad. Because you're not, it's not the, it's not the end. Right? And that's what I tell myself, like, most of the time my kids have been, like, hurt and, like, started, like, crying really bad. Mm-hmm. In fact, to, to where my, when my kids injure themselves, they don't cry anymore. Good. And they'd be crying and I'd be like, it's okay to cry. But I was like, do you think, does it hurt? Do you think you're going to die? Does it hurt so bad you're going to die? And they're like, no, I don't think so. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to die today. <laughs> <laughs> From your scraping your fucking knee or whatever, right? Like. However, you might die in a few days. (laughs) Yeah, you might die from an infection in a few days from staphylococcus or whatever. (laughs) I don't want to go that deep, bro. That's (laughs) fucked up. (laughs) They need to know about germ theory. (laughs) They do know. I'm their dad. They definitely know germ theory. (laughs) Not only do they know germ theory, they know fucking cell replacement and aging. 
Ah, so they explain why I have brown spots and why they need to get more sleep at night than I do. <laughs> so yeah, you have son. you need to replace you need to not only replace your cells, but you need to produce more than you replace because you're still growing. At this point, I'm not even replacing all my cells. And if I slept more, I'd probably replace more of my cells and I'd look younger if I slept more, but whatever. Say love you. All right, moving on. Um, just real quickly, um, I wanted to bring some academic literature into this. I think this is from the Journal of Sociology. This is also quite old. I want to say early 2000s. Yes. Um, but the uh do you can you zoom in just a bit? Yeah. Yes. So um talking about Zionists again. Um There's two kind of approaches that Christian Zionists have to justify their support for Israel, even though it's committing a genocide. And first is uh, the kind of belief that, like, in Genesis, the is Israelites were told, you know, those who bless you will be blessed. And so there's this kind of, like, feeling of solidarity towards them, if I'm reading that correctly. Yeah, yeah. It pays to bless the Jews. Right. Like, hey, being on the side of the Jews, God looks favorably on that, so you should yeah. do it. And if you scroll down, they'll get to the second point. The second approach um, is based on dispensationalist theology, which states that uh, it's the living dispensation of the book of Revelation, which essentially means that we're in the end times. Within this theology, the return of the Messiah is contingent upon a set of events transpiring, and among these, a Jewish state of Israel may be in existence. The dispensationalist theology is a guiding ideology for the Christian Zionist movement, and according to an author, the creation of dispensationalist ideology can be credited 19th century Anglican priest from Plymouth. Um, and so, yeah. It's uh, uh, permeated much of the Christian right movement of today. Um, it's almost impossible to understand how Christian Zionism has come to dominate American evangelicism and been so influential on the course of U.S. Middle East policy. And I didn't even get to all the ways that Christian Zionist lobbies, because there are it's not just APAC. There are other Christian Zionist lobbies yeah. um, that are well funded <clears throat> and therefore can provide bigger bribes and therefore get their agenda moved forward better than other agendas. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I th thought that was interesting because that kind of first one, I think a lot of people occupy that first one, the unknowingly like, well, of course we should support Israel because you know, the Jews and the Holocaust, like when they don't really understand all the details, there's kind of that just default of, Oh, um, you need to go to paragraph six on that last one too, bud. Oh, okay. Sorry, I think so, right? I didn't I didn't understand your note, so I did my best. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. I think it was uh just paragraph uh four and then uh parts of six. So scroll down to six. Um yeah, but and but really then that's kind of relatively benign, right? Like, oh, we should be good to Israel because like Where they're the chosen people of God, which is not really per true, but like I can see that being a pretty wild widely held belief and also relatively benign right because i think that doesn't uh, preclude us from rejecting genocide but the dispensationalists yeah. the ones who say oh we need this for the second coming of jesus are the same as these dominionists in many cases where they want to seize control of state institutions to help usher in the age of the messiah or whatever um so this is a uh, section six apocalyptic Christian Zionism and U S middle East policies. Cause there's a lot and we don't really need to go into all of it, but um, it's a uh, dispensationalism is not only popular among ordinary citizens. It also has achieved unprecedented influence today because it's adherents hold high positions of power in government. And then they list uh, James Watt as secretary of interior for Reagan was one of them. Um, we mentioned the envoy of Jim Jeffries and uh amy coney barrett and uh in the supreme court appointment and uh, mike johnson the speaker of the house all of these people very high positions of power are within this camp of the dispensationalists that 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 israel needs to be supported 
um, regardless of the atrocities they commit, because it is a necessary precondition for us to re achieve our religious objectives. Yeah, just be done with the human experiment and go up to heaven. Yeah, or whatever they believe a thousand year peace of God on earth is. I could show you a thousand year peace. It's if the world all comes together and fucking decides that we want to restore ecosystems to provide for our metabolic needs and the metabolic needs of other organisms. And we all communicate and coordinate to make that happen in as equitable a way as possible. That would be a thousand years of peace. Is the end goal to then kill aliens? I don't know. I don't know. So, um, seems like we need enemies is my point so, so part of this because the rapture is at hand when you think of people like jim uh sorry not jim jeffries uh, mike johnson who one of the first things he said and I, I wanted to bring this up and so maybe i'll talk about this a little bit um on thursday when we shoot the poodoo and talk about the labors uh school labor stuff um but one of his first objectives is to roll back like basically all of the requirements imposed on the federal government to like reduce carbon emissions, like within their departments or outside of their departments. And so like, we're going to cut all this like electric vehicle manufacturing incentives, get the fuck rid of it, all this. And so if uh, you scroll up just a little bit, they're talking about these uh, uh, apocalyptics, um, you know, uh, essentially part of the reason they dismiss environmental problems is because they don't matter Yeah, because we're going to be raptured. Yeah. Or Jesus is going to come again and make a paradise on earth. And we don't need to worry about, you know, species extinction and ecosystem fucking collapse and climate change and extreme weather disasters. You don't have what to if worry it was just about misinterpreted. that. Jesus is coming. What if it was misinterpreted and it's actually, you know, Jesus will come to earth when there is paradise on earth for a thousand years. And at Maybe the end of the did. thousand years, he's like, all right, guys, good job. You made paradise. Congratulations. Yeah, and here they, they're talking about the uh, James Watt again, the uh, Secretary of Interior, and him saying, uh, drilling for oil in national parks, eliminating environmental policies to, to, uh, designed to protect the Earth's atmosphere, rivers, lakes, and oceans. We shouldn't worry about that kind of stuff because our um, about the kind of planet our grandchildren will inherit because the days of the planet of Earth are severely limited. Again, going back to the Mike Johnson and the fucking Creation Museum, they literally believe that the earth is 4,000 years old and it's going to end at 5,000 or 6,000 or 7,000, whatever it is. Right. And so they don't, they don't think about long-term problems. Yeah. And again, how does that contribute to the propensity for violence? When you believe that your world is ending any minute now, why would you be concerned about the integrity of your person? No, you're going to go commit acts of violence, even if you could die in the process or be injured in the process. Because your life is meaningless, it's all about bringing, this, you know, bringing Jesus back for whatever reason. Yeah. All right, we can uh, move on to the next thing in the tracker, which I believe is Netanyahu saying not great stuff. Yeah. So I just wanted to summarize that last bit is infiltrate just to, again to draw attention to this infiltration of government um, in the various ways that. Uh, uh, this kind of ideology has already um, been shaping policy for quite some time. So this is not a new threat. This is a slow roll. I think they said when Roe got overturned, they said the fight had started like 40 years before, 50 years before. Like as soon as Roe started, that's when they started fighting. And yeah. it took them 50 fucking years to overturn it or whatever. Yep. But they did because they were fucking persistent. Mm -hmm. And, and we didn't fucking put it into to like irrevocable law. You know, we didn't make an amendment. Yeah, I mean, irrevocable law. I mean, ultimately, they could have made a law saying you have a, a right to an abortion. And then the Supreme Court could have said, no. Right? They just kind of said, no, Roe went too far or however they argued that Roe was not good and overturned it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think ultimately the Supreme Court could say, oh, no, it violates the Constitution first, like the right to life. They can say whatever oh, I'm saying, the fuck they want. I'm saying make it an amendment. That way they have to reverse an amendment. Oh, you mean amend the Constitution? Yeah, yeah. Indeed, it could amend an amendment at any point. Because the Constitution has been made virtually impossible to amend. What are you talking about? We have so many amendments. Uh, when was the last time we passed an amendment? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. 70s? Was it? I don't know. 
Man. I thought it was like in the 40s. And usually they're more associated with uh when was it? The early they're eras. usually relatively like they're more technocratic. Right? Like they're changing not fundamental things about the way we exist and relate to each other, but like more mundane things. Uh no, in the sixties we had like voting rights and shit, right? Yeah. We had amendments exactly. there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sixties and seventies. So yeah. Okay. Third, fourth, Not 60, impossible, 60, but it takes a lot. Nineteen ninety two. What was that? Wait a minute, let me see. Uh ratification proposed completed. <laughs> oh, never mind. Yeah, it was it was the seventies. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so yeah, we got a video from Netanyahu. Oh yeah, here's BB talking about how he's also an apocalyptic cultist. Go Netanyahu. Ahead. Our war against Hamas is a test for all of humanity. It is a struggle between the axis of evil of Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas, and the axis of freedom and progress. We are the people of the light. They are the people of darkness, and light shall triumph over darkness. Citizens of Israel, October 7th was a very dark and black day in our history, we will fully investigate what had happened at our southern border, the border with Gaza. Everybody will have to provide answers, myself included, but all that will happen only after the war. As a prime minister, I'm responsible for guaranteeing the future of this country, and now my role is to lead all Israelis, the state of Israel and the people of Israel, to an overpowering victory. It is now a time to come together for one purpose, to storm ahead to achieve victory. In joint with joint forces and a profound belief in our justness, a profound belief in the eternity of the Jewish people, we shall realize the prophecy of Isaiah. There will no longer be stealing at your borders and your gates will be of glory. Together we will fight together we will win the prophecy of isaiah is the second coming of jesus yeah i had to look it up but yeah that's what he's referring to uh, so yeah no that's fucking crazy of like you know the, him putting it in those terms which of course he would because what better way to obfuscate genocide in settler colonialism than cloaking it in the white robe of religiosity, right? Like, mm -hmm. what better way? Let's uh, play this clip, um, and then um, we will wrap our thoughts. The reason that I added these breaking point clips, like, pretty much right at the fucking very end as we were putting the show together, because mm -hmm. this posted six hours ago. Mm. I think this was from this morning's broadcast for them, because they do a four days a week, they do a broadcast, I think. Okay. Um, and they basically were talking about Christian televangelists in enlisting support for the holy war in Israel or whatever. And I think that kind of fits in the broader theme that we were going for that, like this issue in the middle East in Israel, Palestine specifically, obviously Israel just wants all that land. Some of that is just because a, the state, is trying to satisfy its own people's needs and expansionism is characteristic of every state since the beginning of the state system. Right. And you could argue probably it's like from the dawn of agriculture, expansionism is a thing, right? David Montgomery makes that argument is, is in his book dirt that basically soil degradation. We've talked about this before. I believe soil mm -hmm. degradation. His, his thesis is that soil degradation, um, basically, uh, 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 made colonialism necessary because mm. peoples would strip their resource base and over farm it by producing over farming and producing an extra surplus. They had more kids or more babies mm. and they had a higher growing population and also people Im immigrated there. And then now you're like in this spot where it's like, well, fuck they'll overthrow me. I will lose power if I don't feed these people. Mm. And now you're in this never ending cycle of 
growth essentially right yeah of the need to constantly expand to to maintain the center in history and that's really a major theme of our show is that history is just a cycle of us reaching fucking flashpoints where those systems crash and break down because that never ending expansion is is not possible within biophysical and 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 also socio-political realities yes we are regular organisms and if we overeat we overdie yep and so i i really included this because it kind of uh it touches on a lot of the stuff we've talked about today and i thought hey we've been producing this show for like five days and we don't have paid producers <laughs> and so i've been like oh so we're obviously on the right page because other people who have way more resources are getting to it a little bit later than we are. Go ahead and roll it. <laughs> and the piece we wanted to have you on to talk about, let's go ahead and put this up on the screen. You've been tracking the way that televangelists have been talking about what is going on in Israel and their war on Gaza. Your headline here is televangelists invoke holy war to push for weapons for Israel strikes on Iran. Um, just talk to us a little bit about the significance of this, Lee, and what you've been tracking. Look, um, this is a very different conflict than other geopolitical issues, China and Taiwan or Russia and Ukraine, in that uh, religion is playing a huge role here. You know, all three Abrahamic uh, beliefs have a eschatology feature that, you know, there are uh, elements of each religion that are pushing for the end times that see this kind of messianic uh, vision of war of uh, control over Jerusalem as critical for bringing about uh, Judgment Day. Uh, here in the U.S., we have something like 90 to 100 million uh, evangelicals. A fraction of those uh, believers uh, are, are people who subscribe to some of these end times uh, beliefs. And you know, going back into the early 1980s when Prime Minister Menachem Begin brought Jerry Falwell and his uh, moral majority to Israel, um, Israel has worked proactively to cultivate uh, these voters. You know, they're, they're looking for a voting bloc that can pressure Congress and you know various administrations uh, to support uh, pro-Israel policies. Um, it's a very concerted effort, and we're seeing that being revved up again uh, with this war. Um, Israeli government officials are reaching out to evangelical voters, encouraging them to uh, help lobby lawmakers. Uh, to put pressure on the media to support this war effort. And, you know, th there's a little bit of cynicism involved here because if you look carefully at uh, some of these Christian Zionist end times uh, theology, you know, it's it's, it's kind of uh, bleak even for Jews and for Israel. I mean, you know, if you look right. at, at this end times theology, um, there is a, a final war over uh, Jerusalem that when Jesus comes back in the second coming, um, there will be a final event where uh, non-believers, including Jews, are all killed, uh, except for 144,000 Jews who are converted to Christianity that have become uh, evangelists for Christ. Uh, and that kind of ushers in the thousand-year reign of Christ. You know, so these, this is not a um, you know, positive event for Jews or, or yeah. for many people in the world. But you know, uh, in this kind of crisis for Israel, they need as much political support as possible. So there's a lot of outrage going on. Yeah, we have one of the videos actually you posted of the Israeli. Yeah, I just thought uh, Lee Fong really summarized it uh, well, um, kind of what we were talking about. Um, and that was released earlier today. So clearly we're on the right page. I, I think, again, uh, kind of like Max Blumenthal earlier, um, I think that they're like hitting elements, but I, I don't I haven't seen anybody really tie it all together and showing how like. Uh, the election of this new speaker is like a I think a fairly significant step forward. Um, yeah. Towards the advancement of this and this the the, the dominionist seizing of our institutions of power. Um, this this could be potentially it's obviously a crisis for the Palestinians. It's a genocide for the Palestinians. Yeah. This is a crisis that could that is creating a domestic crisis at home. Yeah. And. Yeah. Who steps in to regain control? Because it's certainly not our government. Because the leader of our government is fucking senile. Mm -hmm. And projects no fucking power. And the rest are unwilling or inept. 
Correct. So you can go ahead and play the music and I'll summarize. Yeah. I just don't like the idea that someone else's myths are fucking over my real life. I know. What is that uh, kind of uh, fairly well-known phrase? It's like religion is like a penis. It's oh. great that you have one and that you're proud of it. But please yeah. don't stick it in my kid's face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking classic but Very it's true. so true yeah <laughs> stop waving your religion in my kid's face yeah or my face for that matter at least they're all they're, 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 they're circumcised ones right they're the circumcised religions it's true it's true i guess that's better <laughs> i don't know all right so basically the argument that we proposed today was um, that Christian Zionists and Jewish Zionists view this current historical moment as um, a step in the final holy war. Um, that Christian Zionists tend to be fascist or fascist adjacent, especially as we move into this kind of dominionist apocalyptic cult, yep. where now instead of just being like, you know, the the um, Robin Williams. Uh, Dalai Lama or whatever, where he's like, you know, if everybody blows himself up, but he's just like, oh, I don't know, I'm making you deal with your shit. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to intervene, or God, whatever, I'm butchering it. But you know what I mean, where he just kind of steps back and he's like, yeah, I don't fucking care. Like, the rapture people are like, eh, you know, we're going to be raptured because we're believers, right? And if not, and now they're then like, they're in charge of everything. Right. How convenient. And now they're like, we're believers, so we need to take extra steps. And they, this is not not something they just this is not something they just started this is something that they've been building for 50 fucking years and more recently we now have young men who went through the war on terror and who think of muslims and their quest against their their wars against muslims as religiously justified and they've been given really high-tech training and as chris hedges said they have small arsenals, and they do, yep. and they do. When I say small arsenals, some of their arsenals are not small. Some of them could equip, like, probably fucking at least many, many smaller units, if not, like, a division, right? They could probably fill most functions in a military unit, especially an ad hoc military unit, right? Yeah. Like, an unconventional Ten, military tens. unit. Yeah, a bunch of fucking semi-automatic or fully automatic carbines, some fucking long-range bolt-action rifles, right? Maybe what they're missing is some of the big boom-booms, but guess what? It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to seize the big boom-booms from all of the mini National Guard armories scattered across the country, which are literally just weapon stockpiles all over the fucking country. Oh, and there's all the vehicles that the police have. There's all the... Oh. Um... All of the, the arsenals that the police have. have. I mean, let's and face it. Basically, everything that the police have belongs to these people at that point. And we barely touched on how those people are in the police. I had given an example of the police working with these right with uh, violent right wing uh, factions in in the political scene here. Right. Yeah. Of course, the police are part of it, and that's why you actually saw many police and also many military members on January sixth yeah. who thought they were going to storm the Capitol and stop it. And so the title of today's show was called It's Only Treason If You Lose. Um, and there's two reasons I chose that title. And the first reason is because I'm in a lot, a lot of like spaces dominated by right wingers. Speaking of propensities for violence, because I'm shopping for a fucking rifle, like a bench rifle. Mostly I want to do like long range target shooting, but also potentially a hunting rifle. I have been interested in um, uh, getting uh, feral hog tags and helping with conservation efforts by shooting fucking feral pigs that like do all sorts of damage to ecosystems they're invasive that actually sounds um, kind of fun sign me up yeah it sounds really fun right um it's I, i'm probably on a different rifle building journey for for dedicated hog shooting but i am buying a, like a bolt action rifle um and i've been shopping for one and that phrase was somebody's fucking signature line in forum Mm. It's only treason if you lose. And think about it. If you win, if they had taken over the government on January 6th, would they have been called treasonous? Nope. 
all their and that's the mentality okay. is that these people who say that they're gonna die for the constitution because they believe so strongly in the constitution the people who say they're gonna die for freedom have no sense of irony that like their quest for freedom is embodied within a context of, of submission to a higher authority and that they're uh, um upholding the constitution is really violating the constitution to uphold what you believe the constitution should be yeah which means it's revolutionary in some senses and we might even call it fascism because that's what it fucking looks like and the way they want to fucking kill trans people and kill homo uh, homosexuals or, or anybody that likes to fucking suck dick or eat pussy like the fact that they want to do that shit it's just like we should we should all be fucking terrified. We should all be stockpiling food. We should all be fucking learning how to use weapons. We should be learning how to fucking uh, uh, provide trauma medical care. We should be building fucking communication networks and uh, underground railroads of sorts to get fucking trans kids out of places like fucking Reading, right? Figuring out how to smuggle people out of places where they're fucking gonna get murdered for being who they are. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that should be our task. But people on the left are fucking so goddamn ineffectual. And so, god like Chris had just said, we're fucking outgunned, dude. Like, we are outgunned. There's no no sense of fucking reciprocity for the kinds of things that the Dominionist, Christian, fascist fucking movement is preparing for. There is no way to meet that on a, on a battlefield, uh, metaphorical or otherwise. Like, we are fucking fucked. Mm -hmm. Right? And I just wanted to provide a little bit of math here. I know we're over time even more than I wanted. We did get really close to an hour and 30, which is nice. Um, but I wanted to do some fascist math here. So I did some, I don't have the sources. Um, I could provide the sources. Leave a comment below if you think I'm full of shit. And I will provide all of the sources for my math. Um, also, while you're uh, commenting, hate commenting below, please also tell us how we're stupid. Um, also, if you have any suggestions, I'm open for bolt action rifle ideas for kind of a cross between hunting and bench shooting. Um, I'm looking at a heavy rifle. I probably wouldn't want to take uh, hunting, but I think it'll be fucking a good multi-purpose either way. Um, especially if I didn't have to hike too deep into the bush. Um, at any rate, leave those in the comments below and also challenge my fascist mask. So here we go. The uh, population of the United States is 373 million. The adult population is 256. Um, I got 35% of that 373 million is in the age bracket 18 to 40, which clearly we've seen in Ukraine, like they're conscripting people younger than that and also people older than quite a bit older than that hmm. in their their fucking total war just because they're pop they're just being fucking decimated. But let's just say 18 to 40 as a reasonable military age, you'd say, yeah. 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 Um, so that would be um, equal uh, 130 and a half. I round down in all of these just to make my figure a bit more conservative. Hmm. So 130 million. And then I found a few different sources. About 24 to 30% are uh, identify as born again evangelical, which is going to be this population that is uh, the, the Christian Zionist or or. or really kind of the right wing Mike Johnson religious fundamentalist you might even call Christian fascist mm -hmm. 24 to 30% I skew that lower um, and say about 15% just acknowledging that young people are less religious right? and that leaves us with 19 and a half um, the male to female ratio in the United States is about 48 to 51 males to females just for the ease of math I said half of the population is male right um, and so that would be 8 million people. Um, again, I'm rounding down. So we're mm -hmm. at 8 million. Um, and let's just say 5% of that is committed enough to stockpile food, medical supplies, etc. That's 400,000. Mind you, the United, the entire enlisted personnel of the United States military is like 1.2 to 1.4, I think, ish million, right? So we're talking about a third of the entire United States military is committed enough for this. And say so just 3% of those 400,000 
um, are committed enough to go on ruck marches, to train for a uh, close quarters battle, um, to train in squad tactics, to learn how to fucking dominate a battlefield with a rifle, and mm. learn how to fucking maximum kill and not get yourself killed, which is what soldiers do, right? Just 3% of that 400,000, that would leave you with 12,000 people as actual, like, special forces or, like, we'll call it junior special forces grade, right? Because they're not going to have as much training as military special forces, although some of them came out of military special forces. Mm -hmm. So they do have that training. But let's just say they're not really American special forces, but there's 12,000 of them. And the total of... um, Special forces in the army for actual operators, not like support personnel for the U.S. Army, which is the Rangers, the Green Berets. And there was one other group that was part uh, broad, broadly special forces in the army is like twenty two hundred people. Right. Yeah. Just a few thousand. So we got twelve thousand um, uh, junior uh, junior bacon uh, uh, special forces. Right. And then another, out of that 400,000, another 380,000 support personnel to manage logistics, to get them ammo, right? Mm-hmm. To get them weapons parts out of their arsenals. Even if they're too old to participate in battle, they certainly will be willing to give up rifles and or components. Oh, and maintenance rifles. on things, yeah. Medical, food. These are the people that got are raising animals and have uh, have gardens and everything. They're going to be the ones that are safe houses for these people as they operate and move around. And we all know it doesn't take much, dude. One dude with a fucking rifle. What was it in uh, Las Vegas? In in, in an advantageous uh, position, killed like fifty fucking people. Yeah. This dude walked into fucking a bowling alley uh, earlier this week in Maine and fucking killed eighteen. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, imagine. Imagine eight, four, four fire teams, two, two squads of four rush in and fucking go into one of these peaceful protests and just start picking them off. And they've talked to the cops because the cop, oh, they're, my cousin's a cop and he's, he comes to our meeting sometimes too, but he's on duty today and he's going to be over there. He's going to be over there dealing with uh, a homeless person that took a shit in an alley so that he's not here when the fucking bullets start flying and we're going to kill 200 people. Yeah. 300 people we're going to kill 200 people and then there's 200 more that are going to die by being trampled in the fucking chaos mm-hmm. it does not take a lot when people say oh you know oh, no one's going to beat the government there's not going to be a second civil war I just did the math 12,000 people are training physically emotionally spiritually right for holy war combat and we're the fucking targets All of us that believe in fucking cunnilingus, we're the enemy. Don't forget analingus. And analingus. And as we've said a long time ago, we told a friend of ours who was much younger than us. Did I ever tell you the story? We'll end on. We said, somehow analingus came up. We were like, dude, you never lived until you had your butthole lick. And then, and he's like, oh, that's the grossest thing ever. And then like somebody else who wasn't even a part of the conversation was like, no, dude, you're wrong. You're wrong. You got to get your butthole licked at least once. <laughs> of course, take a shower first, of course, right? Obviously. All right, man. Well, at least we can have a little humor and uh, maybe <laughs> engage in some carnal pleasures as we uh, just stare into the abyss of fucking holy war and fascist takeover and mass murder in the United States. And this has been with Thunder's Applause Podcast, a podcast where we like to dig deep into the heavy shit, pun intended. And we also like to remind you that when liberty dies, it dies with thunder's applause. (laughs) Take it easy, y'all. Remember, train yourself now, please. Peace. Later, baby Yoda.